Uh, excited about the uh, Voices series. Next weekend, we kick off with uh, Donald Miller. Uh, he, it's going to be incredible. Blue Like Jazz, um, one of my favorite books that he's written is uh, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. Uh, and uh, his message is going to be awesome next weekend. Encourage you, invite a friend to come with you. Well, this weekend, I want to share uh, a message titled Selah. If you have a Bible, you can turn over to Psalm chapter 46. We'll also put it up on the screen, and we'll get there in a moment. When I was 22 years old uh, in seminary, uh, I went in to interview for credentials. And you may have heard me share this story before, but you know, I did all of my homework. Like I was brushing up on my eschatology, uh, my pneumatology, my soteriology. These are the ologies that you study in seminary. And uh, I was getting ready for the hardest theological. I was ready to resolve the millennium old debate between Calvinism and Arminianism. I was pretty sure I had it pegged exactly when the Lord would return because uh, it's amazing how much you know when you're 22. So I'm bracing for all of these theological questions, and I sit down in the interview room, and I'm nervous, because uh, this is the moment um, they can give me credentials or not, and uh, it's a couple of uh, pastors in the room with me, and a wise pastor asked me an incredible question. In fact, if you want to get to know someone uh, real good, real fast, you ask them this question. Here it is. If you had to describe yourself in one word, what would it be? Okay, that's not a real fair question because I would like to use more than one word because I would like to think of myself as a renaissance man. There's a little, there's some kaleidoscopic dimensions to this personality, like one word? You want one word? Um, but my answer, being totally unprepared, uh, and some of you know my answer, I said driven. And I thought, that I had nailed the interview. I thought in that moment, I just gave probably the best answer they've ever heard. <laughs> like, I mean, they might not even like, they might just ordain me on the spot because we, we got a driven 22 year old on our hands. Like, let's get this guy credentials and let him go. Um, I, I remember thinking that I nailed it. I, was, I just thought the answer was so... Good, and the older I get, I feel like that answer was so bad. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, there's a fine line between selfish ambition and godly ambition. And uh, the, the bottom line is this, there's no place for selfish ambition in the kingdom of God. God will not share his glory. It's all about God and his glory. But I've never met anybody that had near enough godly ambition for the purposes of God. Um, but most of us kind of are on this selfish ambition side. And the truth is, that's where the drivenness was coming from. Probably came more out of ego than anything else. And so over the years, I've often reflected on that answer. And uh, it took a couple of years, but I've been able to laugh at myself. But, but the truth is, um, I'm still pretty driven. Uh, we used to have a minivan and that minivan had kind of a feature on it with uh, an odometer, so kind of distance, and then uh, it had the elapsed time. It didn't matter where I was going. I would click both of those things and, and then go, and the whole trip I'd toggle between them. And if I wasn't making record time, I don't care if we were going to the grocery store, it was a bad trip. Like, I just, I want to get where I want to go, and I want to get there faster than you. Like, I, um, there's just this part of me that, that I run the RPMs pretty high. And so over the years, I've learned that that isn't necessarily healthy for me spiritually. And, uh, and so as we approach 2013, I read a couple of books uh, one titled uh, One Word That Will Change Your Life and the other, uh, My One Word. 
And uh, both of them recommended that you choose one word that you're going to focus on during a calendar year. And so I made a decision that uh, I would uh, choose a word, and that word was Selah. Now, I'm going to define it for you uh, in a second. But before I do, let's go ahead and read this scripture. Psalm chapter 46, verse number one. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Here it is, Selah. Just kind of right over in the margin of most translations of the Bible, almost kind of like a hanging chad, just dangling there on the page. Selah. Next verse. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Verse 8. Come. Behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Seventy-four times. In the Hebrew scripture, the word Selah appears. And it's one of the more mysterious words in the Bible because scholars aren't 100% sure of its derivation or exactly what it means. Now, most of these appearances happen in the book of Psalms, three of them in Habakkuk. But the consensus is that this word probably refers to a musical pause. It's a rest in the melody. Uh, It's silence in the middle of a song. Now, zoom out a little bit. A long rest would be the word that we call Sabbath. That's a long, that's, that's God's rhythm of six parts work and one part Rest. And so think of Sabbath as a whole rest, if you will, talking to musicians, and hopefully I'm using these terms right, because I'm not one of you. I play air guitar. It's about it. (laughs) Now that word Sabbath means to catch your breath. Now what I love about that is that God breathed into the dust and animated it in the form of Adam. Sabbath is how God breathes into us and reanimates us, recreates us, and it's such an important part of the rhythm of life. In fact, if you aren't keeping the Sabbath, it tells me that you're probably trying to play God. You're trying to do more than God himself did because he worked for six days, and that seventh day was a Sabbath. Now, Sabbath... Um, is a whole rest, and I like to think of Selah as a short rest or maybe a 16th rest. If, if Sabbath is a whole measure, Selah is one bar. It's a daily Sabbath, and so we need one day out of the week that we Sabbath, we rest in who God is knowing that he keeps the planets in orbit, and that if we step back for one day, things aren't going to fall apart. In fact, we'll probably just get out of the way of what God is doing. But we also need a daily Sabbath, and that's where Selah comes into play. Now, I love the fact that most translations put it in the margin, because that's what it is. It's margin. It's the margin uh, to rest, the margin to reflect, the margin to daydream, the margin to play, the margin to meditate. 
Now, let me just ask a question, and I don't know how all of our locations will respond, but uh, how many of you, do you have too much margin in your life? Uh, you know what, in a city like this where the pace is moving so fast, my guess is there, there's probably not one of us that says, I have more margin than, like, no, most of us are desperate for more margin in our lives. Now, I like to think of Selah as change of pace plus change of place. Uh, it's being 100% present in the present. It's this ability to leave the past in the past, to not worry about tomorrow, but to be right here, right now. I think Selah is living like each day is the first day and last day of your life. And I think it is because today, today never has been before and it never will be again. And yet we just kind of, we kind of make it through the day instead of experiencing the Selah that God wants us to experience uh, to play off of Martin Luther's words, I think we ought to live like Jesus was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is coming back tomorrow. I think that's at the heart of, of Selah. It's making the most of every moment. I think that Selah, jot these scriptures down, is considering the lilies, Matthew 6, 28, I think it's numbering your days, Psalm 90, 12. I think it's redeeming the time, Ephesians 5, 16. It's casting your cares upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7. It's better as one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere, Psalm 84. It's being still and knowing that he is God, Psalm 46, 10. It's all of that and a thousand other things. Thanks. Now, here's what I've learned. Sometimes it's harder to talk about those things that are kind of near and dear to you. I'm living in Selah right now. Uh, almost, and I've been five, five months. I've been just kind of um, pressing in to, to this word and trying to figure out what it means and what it looks like in my life. But sometimes sharing a picture is one of the best ways to do it. Let me share a few Selah moments. And I'm not sure what order they're in, so go ahead and put one up. Um, now, this is a river that runs through Yosemite National Park. I only wear a cowboy hat when I hike. Um, but I get a little bit of my cowboy on. And uh, this was the day after hiking Half Dome. Okay. I had plantar uh, fasciitis in my, in my foot when I hiked it, and so it was grueling. And getting to the summit, and then we barely got down. We started hiking before sunrise and didn't get back until after sunset because so many other people on our team were going slow. <laughs> Driven part. But you have to wait up for everybody. And so I was exhausted. The next day, we were like, we just scheduled it. We're going to do nothing. When was the last day that you had where you did nothing? You didn't have to be anywhere. You didn't have to do anything. I'll never forget sitting. I sat in this posture for about half a day, in part because I couldn't move my muscles. <laughs> Now, I've learned that Selah is best, not after rest, but after hard work. We have a core value around here. Um, work like it depends on you. Pray like it depends on God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak it. Work like it depends on you, and then rest like it depends on God. Resting is trusting. If you aren't resting, it tells me you aren't fully trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's another picture, and uh, let's see where I'm at. Oh, I'm in, on the dock at Osprey Point. This dock is one of the longest docks I've ever seen. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it's two and a half football fields uh, is the length um, of this dock. When, when, when I'm at Osprey, and I've been going there off and on for, for a lot of years, I'll just walk the dock at a very slow pace. And by the time I get to the end of the dock, somehow out there somewhere, there's Selah. There's just this rest for my soul. And then I can kind of walk back 
And uh, it's a moment for me. It's a place I like to, to go to. I'm going to share one more with you. Last year, Laura and I celebrated our anniversary. Uh, this was on her life goal list, to go to Mackinac Island. And there's a wonderful, beautiful hotel called the Grand Hotel. That's just What I love about this island is there aren't cars. It's illegal to have a car on the island. So all you hear are the clip-clop of horses' hooves, and I, and I love it. It's just like it was so recalibrated. We sat on that porch, and we let the world pass us by. We watched the weather. That's what we did. Hey, there's a cloud. Like, I'm serious. Like, it was so good. Those, to me, are pictures of what Selah looks like. Now, we're going to keep drilling a little bit deeper. Selah, to me, is resting in God's mercy. I don't think you can Selah unless you know. You can't rest your soul unless you know that your sins are nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ and that you are the recipient of mercy. And you know my definition of mercy. My definition of mercy is about a 70-degree day, kind of sunshine, a little bit of wind, in a hammock, <laughs> all of your weight in that hammock, slight little back and forth. That's the mercy of God. That's Selah. That's what, that's what when the writer of Hebrews says, make, make every effort to enter into God's rest. He's saying enter into the mercy of God so you can rest your soul. Selah is controlling your calendar so your calendar doesn't control you. I think Selah is spirit-led spontaneity. Uh, Selah is letting go and letting God. I think Selah is the willingness and the margin to go out of your way to help someone. Selah is all of these things and so much more. But here's what I know for sure. Life isn't measured in minutes. I mean, on one level, this, you know, there'll be dates on your tombstone. But life really is measured in moments. It's those moments that, that define our lives. And here's what I believe I believe that every single day, there's a Selah moment waiting to happen. And so, what I've done this year is I've purposed in my heart that every day, as I keep my journal religiously, it's one thing I'm religious about, is that I try to every day find a Selah moment in the midst, even on my busiest days, where I just write down uh, something that I am grateful for or a moment during the day when I could just sense God's presence. And so the takeaway this weekend is pretty simple. Every day we got to look for a Selah moment. Now, how do we do that? Well, let me talk about three different ways that I think will help us. Number one, uh, and I want to talk some about meditation because I think it's the key to this. Um, uh, meditating on life, meditating on scripture, and meditating uh, on yourself. And I think all three of those things are critical. Let me talk about scripture first. Um, there was a 19th century uh, paleontologist by the name of uh, Louis Agassiz who was a uh, Harvard professor, famous um, uh, brilliant, uh, and his teaching method was pretty revolutionary. He said, instead of relying on textbooks, let's rely on firsthand observation. And so uh, one of the assignments he would give to his classes, uh, and, and a student of his, Nathaniel Southgate Shaler, wrote about this in his autobiography, was that uh, Agassiz would pull out a, a specimen jar with a fish in it, and he told uh, Shaler to examine it. Now, the truth is that, uh, you know, th this particular student thought it would be just like, you know, like take a look at the fish. Um, okay, I see what it is. Boom, we're done. He thought it'd be like one of those two-minute assignments. But after an hour or so, and Shallard thought he had observed everything there was to know about this fish, um, the professor didn't, didn't ask him for his observations until the next day. And then when he gave his observations, like, it wasn't good enough. And so a week passed. And the whole time, 10-hour days for a week, he's just looking at this. And he said, something happened. 
He said, I started seeing things that were there, but I had not noticed before. Um, the symmetry of the scales, the number of teeth, the position of the gills, the paired organs. He said, it, it was like seeing a whole different creature because he took time to truly observe it, or you might say, meditate on it. By the way, this is kind of fun. Uh, according to one Harvard legend, uh, Agassiz once returned to the classroom after a summer vacation and told his students that he had spent the entire summer traveling and only had made it halfway across his backyard. <laughs> I'll catch up with some of you. Um, I, I think we go through life and, and we don't notice. Um, we're in such a hurry. Uh, but reading without meditating is like eating without digesting. We have got to meditate on the Word of God. Now, the same author who would use this word Selah is the one who said, I meditate on God's Word more than anybody. Uh, David would meditate on the Word of God. That means you begin your day pretty simply in the Word of God. Um, you let it get into your spirit. And then during the day, there are Selah moments where the Spirit of God brings it back to you and a dimension of understanding is increased. Let me put it in neurological terms. The human brain typically produces beta waves that oscillate between 13 and 25 cycles per second. Uh, when... But when we're in a state of relaxed alertness, in other words, kind of a, a scaled back, a state of meditation, if you will, the, the alpha waves that are produced by the brain uh, oscillate between 8 and 12 cycles. There will not be a quiz at the end of this sermon, okay? Um, I'm looking at some of your faces. But, but this is significant. Okay, listen to me. There are some truths that will never be discerned by beta waves, that if you're thinking at, at a level where you want quick truth, you're just not going to get it. There are some truths that only through meditation as your brain goes into an alpha wave cycle. And that's why it says be still and know that I am God. It doesn't say like hurry up and know that I am God. No, be still and know that I am God. And so um, I love it. The Jewish... Um, Rabbis used to say that every word of Scripture has 70 faces and 600,000 meanings. Uh, we've got to meditate on the Word of God. It's not just about dissecting Scripture with our left brain beta waves. It's about allowing Scripture to dissect us. Um, all right. Now, I think another dimension of this is really meditating uh, on life. Now, Leonardo da Vinci said that the average human looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, eats without tasting, inhales without awareness of odor or fragrance, and talks without thinking. In other words, we're going through the motions. Like, we just are getting through the day. We're, we're making a living, but we're not making a life. Selah is this ability to just stop. It, you know what it is? It's Jacob in Bethel where he has this moment where um, he encounters God. He goes to sleep but wakes up and says, surely God was in this place and I was not aware of it. it it's about waking up to these miracles that are all around us all the time. I mean, if the sunrise only happened one time, it would be the most spectacular thing you've ever witnessed. But the problem is God is so good at what God does, and he does it day in and day out, that we take it for granted, as if nothing just happened. Are you kidding me? This, this big ball of fire, <laughs> and it happens every day. And, and we keep in orbit, you know, once a year, the whole, the whole loop happens. Unbelievable! Like, these are miracles, but without these Selah moments, I, I think we, we, we aren't aware of them. Now, you don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are, right? Um, in other words, you will see what you're looking for. If you're looking for something to criticize, you will find it. If you're looking for something to celebrate, you will find it. Um, our perceptions are, are huge. I think your explanations of what happens is more important than your experiences, Okay, it's not what happens to you, it's your explanation. It's Genesis 50, 20. Um, uh, story of Joseph, um, you intended to harm me, but God intended this for good. 
In other words, he had these lenses. He, he was able to perceive what God was doing. I think all of us have perceptions, and we've got to be very careful what filter we're looking through. Um, earlier this year, um, discovered that both of our boys needed some glasses. And so, uh, I, man, Zenny is so cheap that uh, I'm kind of cheap. So I thought, we're going to order some glasses. Now, there's a little danger in that because, you know, it's not the double check eye doctor kind of deal. Um, but I figured, like, we'd probably buy 10 there for the price that it would be at an eye doctor, you know, store. And so um, I'm giving you more information than you really need. Welcome to my world. Um, and so I order a pair of glasses, and Josiah is super stoked. Like, I mean, glasses at, at this point, just like the coolest thing in the world. Can't wait to get them, puts them on. And like, I mean, he's just living large, loving it. Like just walking by people, smiling at them. Like, he's like do you see my, do you see these glasses? They're awesome. And so he's super excited. But then about a week later, like he makes the revelation to me that he's like, Dad, I don't see through these things real good. <laughs> but he didn't want to tell me because he's liking the look. Can't see a blame thing, but liking the look. And, uh, and so, but he said, Dad, the funny thing is when Parker looks through him, he sees great. <laughs> Whoops. Wrong prescription for the wrong son. Um, that's been remedied. They both now have glasses that allow them to see the world. Thank you. We each have a unique prescription. We've got to make sure that we're looking through the filter of Scripture. Um, your perceptions are like sunglasses. You know what? If you ever watch the Olympics, the marksmen, you'll notice probably yellow-tinted sunglasses. Why? Because it increases the, the contrast and enables them to see the target more clearly. What is the tint in our glasses? Uh, Albert Einstein said, there are only two kinds of people in the world, th those who um, believe that everything is a miracle and those who believe that nothing is. Um, I believe everything is, and Selah is finding those miracles that are all around us all the time. All right, let me talk about the third category. You know, I think part of it, of Selah, is most of us live most of our lives as strangers to ourselves. We know more about our favorite celebrity than we do about ourselves. And um, we have got to have those moments where we look in the mirror and we reflect on ourselves uh, with intentionality. Now, uh, we're going to celebrate communion in just a couple of moments. Now, the Bible says that before we go to the Lord's table and remember the sacrifice that he made for us, that we're to examine ourselves. <clears throat> now, most of us are better examining the person next to us. But we've got to look on our heart. Well, that takes Selah. That means you have to... The, the reason some people are so busy is because they fear nothing more than solitude or silence where they just have to be with themselves. Blaise Pascal said that all of man's misery is derived from this one thing, the unwillingness to sit in a room silent by themselves. Like, we need to examine ourselves. A uh, number of years ago, uh, I read this story about Arthur Gordon, and we'll close with this. He was experiencing one of those... Um, slums spiritually where just um, kind of flatline emotionally and spiritually, no energy, no real enthusiasm. It got so bad that he finally went to see a doctor to see if there was some physical cause. And uh, the physician realized that it, it wasn't. Um, it was probably the fact that uh, Arthur Gordon had been pushing himself too hard for too long. And um, he asked him a question. He said, where were your favorite childhood memories? Uh, and Arthur told him it was at the beach, and so the doctor told him to spend a day at the beach. Whole day, by himself, no one else, and you got to be there the whole day. And then he wrote out four prescriptions. Um, and he said, I want you to uh, open these at 9, 12, 3, and 6. Now, there weren't any pills or medicine involved, just a little instruction. So Arthur Gordon went to the beach. At 9 a.m., he opened the first prescription. It said, listen carefully. And for three hours, he just listened. Listened to the sounds of God's creation. 
And after a while, I could hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Felt like peace began to kind of fill his soul once again. At noon, uh, he opened the second prescription and it said, uh, try reaching back. Well, he was in a place with all these incredible memories. And so he thought back to those moments in his life where uh, the blessings of God, uh, those moments of, uh, of celebration or wonder or awe, and uh, relive some of the happiest moments of his life. At 3 p.m., he opened the third prescription. It said, examine your motives. He had a moment. He said, it wasn't too long that, that I realized, he said, in a flash of certainty, I realized that if one's motives are wrong, nothing can be right. If you do the right thing for the wrong reasons in the kingdom of God, it doesn't count. Someday when we stand before the judgment seat of God, it will be our motives that are examined. It's doing the right thing for the right reasons. And then finally, uh, at about 6 o'clock, he opened the fourth and final prescription, and it said, write your worries in the sand. Found a stick, started to write out some of the things that, the problems, the issues, the frustrations, uh, and then the tide came in. And sure enough, literally, uh, as if the doctor perfectly planned it, uh, Wash them all away. Here's what we're going to do this weekend. As we prepare to celebrate communion, uh, some of our locations, you got a communion bag. Other locations, you'll be served uh, the elements. Let me say this. It can be your first time here. That This is something uh, that isn't for national community church alone. This is for anybody that has come to a point in their life that they have made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life that understands what these elements symbolize. The cup represents the blood of Jesus. The bread represents the body of Jesus. And to me, communion is a pilgrimage back to the foot of the cross where we found forgiveness for our sin and salvation and right relationship with God. You know what? If you've never made that decision, I mean, what a great opportunity to do that right here, right now. Uh, we would invite you, maybe as your first act of faith, to celebrate communion with us. And so our bands at all of our locations are going to come. And uh, instead of singing and letting someone else tell us what to say, we're just going to spend some moments in Selah this weekend. We don't do this very often. We're going to take a few minutes and allow you just to be in the presence of God, allow the Spirit of God to work in your heart, maybe a time to examine yourself, maybe a time to reflect on the goodness and mercy of God. And so for the next few minutes after I pray, we're going to invite you to Selah, and then when everybody has been served and we're ready, we'll come back up and we'll celebrate communion together as a congregation. Lord, we offer these moments to you and pray, God, that you would speak into our hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that we would receive a, a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, that you would come and animate us again. Lord, help us in these moments not to be distracted, but to hit the pause button and to, to literally try to position ourselves at the foot of that cross to be able to visualize the sacrifice that you made, the pain that you endured so that we could be set free and forgiven of our sin. We pray that you would help us in these next few moments to ready our spirits to celebrate what you have accomplished for us. In Jesus' name, amen.